the Professional Student Executive Board. Uh, we are uh, host. We are helping host a uh, cryptocurrency webinar um, with our uh, good friends from the Blockchain and the Bird Group. Uh, we've got Josh uh, McIntyre, Rebecca White, and we'll also have um, another individual from Blockchain and the Bird, uh, Laura, I believe. Her, Laura Taylor. Um, she'll be joining us. And uh, we'll, we'll start this discussion here. But the first part of this will be uh, with Josh. And um, he's going to be going over some slides and giving us an introduction. Um, this section of the lecture of the webinar will be recorded. And then after we go through this section and uh, Josh explains the fundamentals, I guess, so to speak, um, we'll open up to Q&A. And that section won't necessarily be recorded. Um, so you can feel free to ask as many questions as you like. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Josh. Well, thanks so much. I, I appreciate, uh, Tyler, you having uh, myself and Rebecca and Laura. Um, we have a really, really fun group here in Pittsburgh. We, we love doing this. Um, so what I want to do tonight is I want to give kind of a, a primer on cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and blockchain technology uh, with kind of a focus on business students. So, you know, we're not going to get into super boring technical stuff. Uh, it's all going to be about the basics of the technology and then use cases you might apply to your careers as a business professional. So first, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a software engineer at Microsoft in Pittsburgh. So I come from a technical background. You know, I'm a, I was a computer science student at St. Vincent. I'm a software engineer. I'm used to really the technical side of things and, and uh, getting into code, breaking down technology. Uh, I work on Azure storage uh, for Microsoft as my day job, uh, which doesn't really have anything to do with cryptocurrency. But uh, this is a technology that I'm really passionate about and interested in uh, learning and kind of explaining to other people. So I have a side project, which is um, chaintoots.com. And I create uh, articles, video tutorials, and code projects, uh, and I do speaking engagements like this to help explain this technology to people. So today we're also here with uh, Rebecca White and Laura Taylor. Uh, these are the awesome founders of Blockchain in the Berg. They are a huge pleasure to work with. Um, Rebecca is an avid Litecoin fan and uh, really works a lot on promoting adoption with the Litecoin fam. And uh, Laura is a mathematics teacher and works with the Digibyte Awareness team. So we have a pretty broad spectrum here of people interested in uh, crypto projects. So how many of you have heard of Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, or blockchain? Maybe you can kind of do a little hand raise. Rebecca's heard of it. Two participants raised their hand. Excellent. So how many of you have actually owned some cryptocurrency? And how many of you have actually used your own wallet or made a cryptocurrency purchase? You didn't just buy some and hold it in an exchange. Excellent, there's uh, more hands up. So what is a cryptocurrency? Well, cryptocurrency is a form of peer-to-peer -peer digital cash. It's money implemented as a computer protocol rather than a government or corporate policy like what we're used to. So it's an independent currency and not just a payment network tied to the US dollars like PayPal. And it has some unique and useful problem solving properties. Cryptocurrencies are, they're decentralized. So they're not controlled by a central corporation or government or particular entity. They're censorship resistant, meaning that there's not a central system that can stop you from using uh, these cryptocurrencies or stop any particular transactions. And they are global and peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, these are the major public blockchains like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Digibyte. But there are other uses for private chains. So they're also decentralized. And what is decentralization? That's the idea that no government or corporation controls a cryptocurrency. So instead, these are built on a network of people just running open source software. So individuals, miners, and businesses. 
What these cryptocurrencies are, they're really a protocol. It's an agreed upon set of rules implemented in software. And those rules cover transaction processing, issuance of the currency itself, and those sort of topics. Now what's censorship resistance? Well, given that cryptocurrencies have this property of being decentralized, so there's just people running software across the world, there's no central processing authority that can freeze your funds, there's no central authority that can stop transactions. Use of these networks are permissionless. Now, there are cases like exchanges, for example, where you would buy and sell or trade cryptocurrencies. They do have know your customer and anti-money uh, anti laundering, AML, laws that they have to comply with. And that's because these are particular businesses that are operating as like money transmitters or financial services. But the networks themselves, the actual Bitcoin network, the Ethereum network, the Digibyte network, are completely permissionless. If you have that cryptocurrency and you have that cryptocurrency wallet and a uh, data connection to the internet, you can create transactions, you can send funds, and there's, there's nobody out there that can stop you from doing that. And that's by design in this system. Uh, compared to what we're used to in the traditional banking system, it helps with those use cases like uh, contributing maybe to you know, causes somewhere that uh, that particular government doesn't like, um, sending money overseas, those sorts of things. It's a, it's a really, really powerful tool that you get by using these uh, permissionless cryptocurrencies. And finally, cryptocurrencies are global and peer-to-peer. -peer. And this is one of the things that I really love about this technology in, in general. It's something that empowers individuals to hold their own money and uh, be able to send money to anyone, anywhere, without this concept of borders, whitelists, uh, those sorts of things that, again, you have in the traditional payment system. You know, if you want to send money to a friend that's in a different country, in a different part of the world, with the traditional system, there's a lot of friction with that. Uh, something like an ACH transfer or Western Union, it's really high fee, um, so it's going to cost you a lot of money as a percentage of the transaction to send that. And it often takes days and days for the money to get there. And finally, there's a lot of cases where in certain countries you can't send money at all. So if you're an uh, immigrant from a country like Iran, for example, Western Union doesn't even do business there. So you couldn't send money to your friends or family. But with Bitcoin, with Digibyte, with Litecoin, you can send that money on this network anytime anywhere to anybody uh, for next to no fees and the money is there almost instantaneously. This is a network that operates 24-7, 365. And that's an amazing property when you consider uh, you know, business days and those sort of things that you have to deal with uh, in that traditional system. So how do we get there? What allows cryptocurrency systems to have these really interesting properties that debit cards and PayPal don't. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the technology. And, you know, my goal here is not to get too technical and overwhelm anyone. I simply want to explain a little bit about how this works. And that way you can have the takeaway of, oh, you know, there's this particular algorithm uh, that does this and allows Bitcoin to be centralized, that uh, decentralized, that kind of thing. So it's important to know that cryptocurrencies use a proof of work blockchain for distributed consensus and use digital signatures to prove asset ownership securely. So you've probably heard of the term blockchain before, especially if you're looking at this in a business context, uh, because there are other proposed uses for blockchains other than simply these digital assets. But what a blockchain is, is it's a public record or ledger of all transactions or transfers that have occurred in the history of that cryptocurrency. So if Rebecca sent me money, that is recorded on the public blockchain. And a new block of transactions is batch processed 
every n minutes, depending on the chain that you're using. So this batch processing of transactions occurs about every 10 minutes on Bitcoin and Bitcoin forks like Bitcoin Cash. Uh, with Litecoin, it's roughly every two and a half minutes. And uh, with cryptocurrencies like Ethereum and Digibyte, it's down to 15 seconds. Now, each block contains a cryptographic link to the previous block. And that's really important because uh, these systems use cryptography to uh, secure the chain. And this link to the previous block makes it harder and harder over time as you add transactions on top of your transaction, add blocks on top of your transaction to actually roll back history on the network. So one of the major, very, very important properties of these proof of work blockchains is that they are immutable. When you do a transaction, when I send money to Rebecca or I send money to Laura, and that recorded that is recorded on the blockchain, that becomes history that can't change. That transaction is not reversible. And in terms of you know, the, the way that the network is actually designed, it becomes impossible over time to reverse transactions because of the proof of work algorithm we're gonna talk about next. So now, what is this proof of work? For a new block to be uh, mined, as we call it, uh, for a new block to be batch processed and added to the blockchain, uh, there's special computers on the network running the Bitcoin or Digibyte software that are called miners. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to solve a very difficult guessing problem. This is truly a guessing problem. It's, it's a special bit of cryptography called hashing. And the only way to find an answer to the proof of work problem is just to use a bunch of computing power and electricity to run through a bunch of guesses until you find the one that's correct. However, a special property of this problem is once this problem is solved, anybody else on the network can verify that that answer that the miner found is correct instantaneously. Hence the term proof of work. If a miner actually does all of the guessing work to find an answer to this problem and they present an answer to the rest of the network, the rest of the network can verify that answer and based on the difficulty that's set for that problem, it really serves as a proof that you expended a certain amount of electricity and computing resources to find an answer to the problem. So what this does that's really important is it ties this purely digital asset into uh, very real world expensive physical assets in the form of uh, specialized computing chips and uh, the form of electricity. You know, electricity is expensive. And so uh, there's a system of economic incentives in Bitcoin for doing this proof of work problem. The miner that solves the proof of work problem gets a reward of new Bitcoin that's minted when every block is processed. So that's how the currency is actually issued and uh, transaction fees for that block as well. So, you know, when you do a, a credit card transaction, Visa takes a chunk of that transaction from the merchant, uh, and that's a transaction fee with Bitcoin. Uh, you know, you're not sending your transaction fee off to a middleman. Uh, what you're actually doing is you're rewarding people that are using their computing power to secure the Bitcoin network. And each previous block is uh, linked. So it turns out that if you wanted to try to change, say, some transaction that occurred three blocks back, not only would you have to refine uh, the proof of work for that block, but you would also have to find the proof of work for the two blocks that were that are new ahead of it uh, and outrace the network to do so. And because of the difficulty of this guessing problem, that becomes impossible to do over time. And that's what secures the chain. So, you know, when you get three blocks back, six blocks back in history, there's no chance that anybody is gonna be able to um, spin up a bunch of extra computers and uh, reverse any transactions. So a final interesting sort of technological part of this is the concept of digital signatures. 
So I'm guessing most of you here have used a debit card or a credit card, right? When you go to Target and you use your credit card, what you actually give the merchant is private information. And that's your account number. And then you give that merchant permission to draw a certain amount from your account. And you kind of just trust that they're not going to take your credit card number and run up your credit line and run away with all your money. And you also have to trust that they don't lose uh, your financial information, which has actually happened with the example that I used, which is Target. So Bitcoin uses a much different and much better system for handling this information. Every wallet contains uh, secret information called private keys. And then there's a one way cryptographic algorithm used to go from that private key to a public key and address. And with Bitcoin, what you do is you never give anybody private account information that somebody draws from or pulls from in a pull transaction. What you give somebody as the receiver is a public receiving address. So if you open up a cryptocurrency wallet and you've never used it before and you uh, see your receiving address, uh, you, could, you could give that out and plaster that on a billboard. There, there's nothing secret about that. It's completely secure to do so because you can't go backwards from the public key back to the private key. So when you do these Bitcoin transactions, what you actually do is you, um, you prove by using a digital signature that you are the rightful owner of the funds in your wallet that you're sending off to somebody else's public address in that transaction. So it becomes a chain in that way. Uh, Rebecca sends money to me. Now I own funds at a receiving address and I prove that I own those funds by using a digital signature with my private key when I send those funds off to somebody else. But with these digital signatures, you don't reveal the private key at all. You only reveal a signature and your public key, which is uh, a part of your receiving address. And so anybody can verify cryptographically that you're the rightful owner of the money that you're trying to spend uh, and this transaction that's recorded on the chain without you ever having to reveal anything secret. And that's really powerful compared to what we have now because you know, we spend a ton of money on fraud prevention and that sort of thing. And really every time we use our you know, debit cards and credit cards, we're kind of risking a breach of our personal information. Uh, is this gonna be on the test? All this, the, these blockchains, proof of work, digital signature. Um, I always like to include this slide after I, I talk about some technical stuff. If you're a little bit confused about the technical details, I don't want you to fret. I don't want you to, to be worried and confused. It's only important to know a little bit about why cryptocurrencies have these amazing and interesting properties, not necessarily all the details. So if you just understand a little bit that there's this special algorithm uh, and there's, there's this mining process that keeps it so transactions can't be reversed, or that you understand that uh, it's safe to give out a receiving address and that you don't have to exchange private information to do a Bitcoin transaction, you can understand why it's useful and you can apply those sort of technical properties to your use cases. So next, um, I wanna open up, we're gonna have kind of a chat between myself, Rebecca and Laura about some interesting use cases. So uh, let's chat here. I have some slides uh, with some, some interesting use cases that have popped up that we have used and we can just talk about uh, what makes this all so interesting. So some ideas to get started. Uh, Rebecca, why don't you talk about uh, Litecoin uh, as it's used for small business payments and like some of the things that Johnny Litecoin talked about. Sure, so um, can you hear me? I'm good, I'm not on mute, right? Yep. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, yeah so um, there is a huge crypto Twitter community. Um, if you're on Twitter, it, it really is like finding a home if you're really into this. And one of my friends, one of our friends, actually, his name is John Moore. He's from New Jersey and he does payment processing. 
on Twitter, he's Johnny Litecoin. Um, and he has over the last several years promoted the use of Litecoin rather than um, dollars or credit card usage um, because it's a better form of money. So that means that what Josh was talking about, like when you go and you spend your Litecoin or your Bitcoin or your Digibyte, um, no one can ever come back to that uh, um, supplier or that uh, business and say, oh, wait, we made a mistake. Um, somebody said that they didn't really spend that money. Um, where when you use your credit card, a company could could take that money and you could receive that service, but I could go back in three months and say, wait a minute, I don't want to pay for this anymore. And then the credit card company will reverse it. And that, um, cost, that, that business is out that money. So he has converted, <laughs> I don't know how many hundreds of um, businesses around the um, college towns in New Jersey, Southern New Jersey, near New York City in his own hometown. We had a meetup where we went to a restaurant and, um, and everybody paid with Bitcoin or Litecoin or um, Digibyte. And it worked out really well that the bartenders were um, able to wait on more people because we were simply scanning our QR codes and we weren't handling money back and forth. Uh, and we were able to tip those waitresses and servers and very easily into their own wallet. And um, it, it really is a very interesting um, concept using cryptocurrency for buying a coffee or a t-shirt or, you know, different types of things. So, um, so John came to one of our meetups and, and did a really great presentation. There's actually a lot of places that you can use cryptocurrency um, on the on the web or not many in Pittsburgh that I know of. I only know of one, but um, but it is pretty cool that you that you can buy it and then use it rather than just have it sit as a store of value. Yes. <laughs> this cell phone here, this is actually a new one. So I've now bought two cell phones uh, with Bitcoin Cash, which is a fork of Bitcoin that I like to use. Um, the laptop that I'm streaming on is paid for with Bitcoin Cash. Um, <laughs> even my phone bill, I have. Um, some jujitsu gear, some jujitsu and MMA gear that I purchased through the Bitcoin.com store. Uh, you know, so all like really cool hard goods and, uh, you know, devices and things that I've actually purchased with crypto. And I always love to do that uh, because I think it's a fundamentally better, more secure way of, of doing payments. So, it, you know, I, I love that use case of actually buying goods and, and services with, with crypto. Um, and I I think um, Overstock.com accepts crypto, and there's some travel agencies. Um, Cheap Air, you can pay for your airline ticket with crypto. It's it is kind of cool when you stumble upon it and you see. I think New Egg, which is a um, technologically that they sell like uh, computers and things like that. I think they take Bitcoin too. So it's kind of fun to see a bunch of di different places, and if you just stumble upon it, I'm always tickled when. I I'm like, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, that New Egg is actually the electronics retailer I go yeah, for for most devices now because because they'll accept uh, accept Bitcoin, which is great. Um, so there's also you know lots of interesting blockchain apps and like you can even do identity on the blockchain now. So uh, Laura, tell us a little bit about some of the fun projects going on with uh, Digibyte and their community. Okay, and, uh, some um, of their some of their use cases. Okay. Um, I will say, you know, one of the other use cases that I really like for, for crypto, especially is, um, is charities. Um, it gives, you know, it's, it's a different level of transparency and, you know, especially putting, you know, if you can get crypto into the hands of some of these third world countries where they're really, you know, Venezuela and Zimbabwe, their, their inflation's through the roof. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a different level of health. Um, and you can, you know, you can you can work more directly with those charities if they're participating with that. So, um, you know, not all charities take it, but that's definitely something that we work on trying to educate people on how to take it, um, how to set up their wallets and that sort of thing. Um, so that's just like a, a use case that I really like. Um, and, and also, though, be very cautious, you know, like, like Rebecca was saying, crypto Twitter is kind of a, you know, I, I was kind of, I really never had 
a Twitter account until I got into cryptocurrencies. And as I was trying to find information, it just is a place where it's, it's easy to find information. It's also easy to find false information. So, you know, everybody, we're all like, I would say a lot of us who are in the volunteer community naturally are, are, givers you know probably to a fault and i have to say i've given to you know charities before so just you know really make sure if you are doing anything like that really be careful and vet those things out <laughs> but um it's very easy to to be scammed for the same reason you can't have the chargebacks you know so once it's gone it's gone um which requires a little extra safety but as far as digibyte you know we are um, a currency like bitcoin and litecoin and um we don't have the adoption as a payment uh level like those two currencies they're both older than we are we're five years old bitcoin it's is it 10 it's 10 right 10 just about i think the actual network is closer than nine okay um, but yeah it's and so yeah older. so bitcoin and litecoin are older than we are and um and so they're they're definitely more readily accepted as a currency. It's one of the things that we're we're working on as the community. And Rebecca and John have really uh, really helped us out with that. You know, spreading the word. And I don't know anybody because these two can go anywhere and get someone to take crypto. I think they're so good at it. So uh, so we're working on the currency aspect of it. Um, one of the things that drew me to the project was um, when I got into blockchain. I Two problems I wanted to see solved was an alternative to fiat and uh, better login security. Like when we log into websites, it's just, it's it's such a, it's it's such an attack vector. It's an easy one with social media, and we always use the same passwords. And it's just it, it's very easy uh, to get hacked, as we've seen. Um, and then you know if your information's let's say on somebody's server somewhere and that server gets hacked, you know, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of danger in that space, a lack of security. So what DigiID does, and this is one of the things that drew me to the project, um, is it uses the, uh, it's like LastPass on steroids. So you know how LastPass can remember your passwords for you and kind of manage those and, and so you don't have to think about it. Well, all that information is stored somewhere on a central server. So what this does is it allows you to use the, you're not using necessarily the blockchain, but you're using the, you're using the technology of the wallet um, to, to use that to log into a website. So it has that level of security. And so once you have your DigiID set up, you can assign like a four to six digit pin. And if a website is using DigiID as a login option, then instead of having to log in with my email or my password and my username, um, I can just log in with DigiID using that, you know, sequence of numbers. So it's much easier to remember um, and it's much more secure. And all of this is open source. So, you know, DigiID has an iOS and an Android um, app. And you can, and it's also in the Digibyte wallet, but you don't have to have the Digibyte wallet. You can have just the ID app. And then the, uh, we have a WordPress plugin for that. So anybody who runs a website that has a login, they can just, you know, they can use the, the plugin and it's a, just a secondary option. It's not to say you have to have the only option. And there's no, you know, we're, we're really trying to get the awareness of this technology out there and getting more people to use it. Um, there, one of my favorite sites um, is uh, Change Angel. It's a it's a wallet to wallet swap exchange, and these are these are people who work on the awareness team with me. I've known them for a couple of years, and they they developed this um, platform, you know, out of that idea. And they really wanted to see DigiID in a use case, and it was before it really got big. So they are were the first to implement it. And I'm telling you, logging into that website is so fun because it's like magic. You're like what just happened you know and and to know that you're more secure that way so i really you know i think digid is really um it's a really dynamic uh technology and I'm, i really do hope that more people implement it and use it because it is free and it is more secure um so we've got that and we're we're also working we have digi assets which is still in development but people are already you know if you have an android you can create an asset right now they're more at a level of a trading card or you know something like that we have a guy who works for uh, uh fox 
And so uh, he did some digi assets for Mass Villain, you know. So, you know, they're, you know, they can be right now if they're at a trading card level, we're working on the technology to make that more, you know, dynamic as well. But uh, so we're, you know, got a lot going on. Thanks so much, Laura. Yeah, I think the Digibyte community is really interesting. I, um, you know, there's so many cryptocurrencies out there. I'm a big fan of kind of like that peer-to-peer -peer cash, you know, easy to use, low friction type of cryptocurrency. Um, so I focus a lot on like Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, Litecoin, um, you know, Bitcoin in some cases. And uh, I kind of brought Digibyte into like my main, you know, couple ones that I study and focus on because I think it's, it's doing, a, a, that community is doing a great job of building another product that is, that's frictionless, that's easy to use uh, and, and solving some interesting problems. So um, I wanted to also talk about some other ideas for use cases that uh, our friends here might find interesting. And, uh, you know, for bigger businesses, right? We've, we've talked a lot about this on the individual level, but cryptocurrency and blockchain, I think is gonna be really important on an enterprise level as well. Uh, because it, it does a great job of, eliminate, of eliminating friction, which is something that there is a ton of in the enterprise space. So if you think about it now, what happens when you have to transfer money between two different bank accounts? If I wanna do a transfer from the bank that I use uh, to say a bank I have an auto loan with, and this is actually a real thing that's happened to me, um, I do an ACH transfer. That's a, that's a clearing house that works between banks. It takes on the order of about two or three days to transfer and fully settle that money uh, from one checking account into another checking account. And then when I go to transfer money from the new checking account to onto the auto loan, that's another two or three days before that's totally settled. So from when I get my paycheck to when I wanted to you know, pay, pay off this loan, it would usually take about five days for that actually to be settled and then I could record down you know, how much I pay it down and that sort of thing. Why now with all of the technology that we have, does there have to be that much friction and that much uh, of a time suck to do those sort of transactions? Well, this is something that blockchain technologies can really help with. When you do a transaction on Bitcoin or Litecoin or Ethereum, that transaction is generally safe to accept for a merchant uh, in small amounts instantly once it's broadcast to the network. Um, so, you know, if you do like a Bitcoin cash payment or a Litecoin payment and, uh, you know, you're buying some coffee, once they see the transaction pop up on their screen, that's pretty safe to accept for small amounts. Now, that transaction is fully settled in, in the same way that it would be fully settled in a bank system in on the order of 15 seconds to 10 minutes, depending on the cryptocurrency. And that, that full settlement happens when that transaction is included in a block and then we say it's confirmed, right? Um, if you're talking about really, really high amounts and you want the most security, you might wait uh, on the order of an hour to consider that transaction fully settled. Uh, about six transactions deep in, in Bitcoin and Bitcoin forks. So compare that to fully settled in days, possibly months for these traditional systems. Uh, you know, another use case, just an example, right? Uh, say you want to sell some stocks that you have in a brokerage account and then deposit those proceeds into your uh, checking or savings account as cash. Same idea, right? There's a settlement that takes forever that has to occur um, when you do the asset sale. Then there's another settlement that has to occur that takes a couple days on the money transfer side of things, the ACH transfer. And so there's so much unnecessary friction built into these legacy systems that can be dramatically improved on with cryptocurrency systems. Not only are they much you know, more frictionless of an experience, uh, so much less time spent waiting for these sort of things, they're also fundamentally more secure uh, because you don't have the counterparty risk that you have with this traditional system. The reason that these things take so long to settle is the idea of counterparty risk. If, you know, my, if bank B is going to deposit funds into a user's account from a transfer from bank A, bank B has to do their due diligence to determine that bank A's account 
actually has the funds that it says it has. Um, and that may take multiple hops for things like wire transfers, which is why they take so long. There's trust involved at every step. But the way cryptocurrency systems are designed, they are trustless. So once you create a transaction, you have a valid digital signature uh, and anybody else can see on the blockchain that you've provided a valid digital signature, a valid transaction, you have followed the rules. Everyone can see that you are the rightful owner of the, the funds that you're claiming to spend on the blockchain. And that can be considered fully settled, irreversible history on the order of minutes. And I think that's going to be a very powerful thing uh, that we see businesses adopt as we go along. We're also talking about significantly reduced costs for fraud. Rebecca talked about uh, one thing that many merchants love about accepting cryptocurrencies, and that's no chargebacks. So a consumer can't come into your store uh, and pay with Litecoin and then two weeks later get that money back by saying uh, they never got what they they paid for in doing a, like a credit card chargeback. So there's a reduced cost there. But there's also a significant reduced cost when it comes to fraud prevention and identity theft prevention in general, um, which is what I was talking about earlier with this uh, push mechanism digital signature based system. Uh, the credit card companies since their inception have spent billions and billions of dollars making sure that merchants that accept credit cards don't overcharge what they said they were going to charge. Um, millions are spent in dealing with um, IT infrastructure and security to keep credit card information secure um, and or settle for leaks that happen. And so when you use a system that's just designed from the get-go to be better and more secure, uh, you reduce a lot of those costs and you prevent a lot of pain in your organization from happening. There is also, I think, nearly limitless use cases for this uh, when it comes to supply chain, healthcare, uh, the law, you know, and we can maybe go into some examples for those details. You know, I just kind of want to plant that seed for everybody that's listening, that it's not just money, it's not just cryptocurrency, but uh, this, these foundational technologies can uh, solve a lot of other in interesting problems. And I also do like to add the caveat, especially with a young technology. Um, blockchain and cryptocurrencies don't solve every problem. Um, so sometimes there are people out there that want to sell you on blockchain uh, in instances where blockchain actually isn't the best tool for the job. So that's why, again, I think it's important to really learn and understand how these technologies work, why they work, and apply them to your use cases in an intelligent way. Um, because, you know, the, uh, this technology is a very diverse toolbox uh, that you can open up, but it doesn't have every tool out there. And so you, you want to be cautious and you want to, um, you know, intelligently apply this technology to different use cases out there. So with that, um, I want to, again, thank Rebecca and Laura for being a part of this discussion. Uh, these two ladies are amazing to work with, and they have a lot of interesting knowledge and, and perspectives uh, on these technologies. So uh, I want to encourage everyone to join us at Blockchain in the Berg uh, physically or perhaps digitally, uh, depending on how things things pan out here in the near future. Uh, but we're a lot of fun. Yeah, we're a lot of fun. We love to talk. Um, and, uh, you know, thanks again, of course, to our host for the opportunity. I just kind of wanted to wrap that up because uh, I'm going to stop the recording here and then we can move on just to a, a live Q&A. That way everybody can feel comfortable uh, popping up on the screen and, and